So I'm very happy that uh, we have you here. So someone who is um, very knowledgeable in the field of communication, but also in the field of new work. So welcome to A2S. Thank you for joining and enjoy this inspiring talk of Christoph. Ben. Thank you so much. Alex. You're welcome. All right. I'm unmuted, which is good. Went back and forth. So um, you want to you wanna hear the truth? We're on the road for you guys for two days already. <laughs> Made some advertisement uh, for your channel. So I'm completely wasted. So I will try to give you everything I can and share the first hand experience. Um, the truth is also that um, I officially run Blackboat, but my people would say, this is what I officially do, doing a podcast and YouTube videos all the time. And I kind of hijack my passion and brought it to the company because what I really, really want to do in my life was filmmaking, but I was not talented enough to go to an advertisement agency back in the days or for a filmmaking course. So I started to upload videos on YouTube and learned it the hard way. And then the podcast, which is about new work. And um, in that period of the last two years, we learned a lot, which we also used for the projects. This can be collaboration projects in companies like your work tools that you work with and change these kind of tools to the new way. But this can also be stuff like relationship between people. And what I want to share today is an experience, I would call it the formative moment. These are moments when you look back and you think that was a time when change happened. And you can usually recall it looking backwards. Very hard to do it forward. I give you one example and this usually tells me how old the, the audience is. This is a formative moment. I had an audience which then referred and said, which concert was that? And then I knew, okay, these, guy, these guys were all on Snapchat and uh, around 20. Um, of course, this is when the wall came down. I was seven years back then. And I can remember my mom and she was crying. She was crying and for her it was very emotional. And these formative moments need to be emotional to remember them. So they can either be the oh shit moment or the magic moment. To me, seven years old, the emotional moment was that moment actually, when <laughs> David Hasselhoff <laughs> saying I've been looking for freedom and I can remember that. So, but what are other formative moments in my life? Um, these are three of them, 96, 1996, I sent the very first email to a, a letter friend I had in Canada, I still have him, it's Chris Meyer, a good friend of mine, and I sent him the very first email, christoph.magnussen at tonline.de, my first email, and we usually were sending faxes back and forth. So I sent a fax afterwards, hey Chris, did you receive my email? And he sent me a fax back, yes, I received your email. And I'm like, what the fuck? <laughs> but I could, I could tell you, okay, this, this is magic because now you can easily send faxes via the computer, which is basically what we do today. Then Napster, who remembers Napster? Magic moment, yeah, Dr. Dre from Napster. I could download it and had it and listen to it without paying, it was magic. Of course, in 2003, um, I had Salesforce, a cloud tool, which is now standard in the cloud world. And back then it was crazy. People were asking like, how could you store data in the internet? It's crazy. And today Salesforce has the most expensive building in San Francisco growing very fast. Or just one more example, who's using WhatsApp every day? <laughs> oh shit moment for the Deutsche Telekom. Um, these guys made like 4 billion profit every year with a text message and now everyone uses WhatsApp. So that's oh shit or magic, formative moments. And um, this was one of the last um, oh shit moments I had. Um, it's about the game of Go. Who does not know what it is? Give me a hands up. Who does not know what the game of Go is and how it works? So very, very simple. Can you imagine there is a sport that is as popular as soccer in Germany? Everyone's going crazy. So this is Go in South Korea. This game works the following way. You have these little white and black um, figures and you need to capture territory. So it's quite simple in what you need to do, but it's quite complex in how you can move. You have, in, in, in contrast to chess, you have more options to move than there are atoms in the known universe. So endless. With a chess computer, you could calculate the strategy. Here, you need something very human, intuition. You need to look the guy in the eyes and say, oh, you might didn't sleep so well last night, so I use a different strategy. Mm, you sound a little bit aggressive today, so I use a different strategy. And then I apply that strategy to the game. This guy in the background is Lisa Dole. 
he's by far the biggest Go player of all times. And you guys say, I don't care about Go. I care about soccer or something else. I don't care about it. But for him, this game is his life. And in this documentary, you see him with his daughter, four years old, and enters the building. So his daughter is like, to her, he's David Guetta of Go. Huh? I mean, who has a four years old daughter knows up until puberty, you're David Guetta and then everything changes. So what happens here is the moment when he realizes he's beaten by a machine, not by a human being, which is like two years ago. Why is this such an oh shit moment? This is because of what I just told you about how difficult it is for this game of Go to calculate and to win. And we met a guy, Jürgen Schmidhuber, very successful professor in Germany, and he's one of the top five AI guys. And he talked about this game and he said, in, the 19, in 1997, when you had the first chess computer beat a human being, people assumed it would take 100 years to build a machine that could beat someone in Go. So it just happened two years ago. So much faster than we actually thought. And for a guy like Lee Sedol, where Go is his life, the world just flipped upside down. So what I want to share with you guys is how can we turn a potential oh shit moment into a magic moment? What can we do about it? And the secret to me is in the words react versus respond. React is always this emotional reaction you have in the first moment. When you see something, you, re you read a headline and you're like, how should that work? The response is you go one level deeper before you react too fast and you think about it, what this really means. So here are my three learnings and I would love to discuss them with you in the Q&A afterwards and then we can go into details and I can share pretty much everything you guys want to know. Um, so, number one, and this is the most important one. Nobody knows anything today. We interviewed in the podcast and the videos so many people, so many experts. And if you meet someone, which and this includes me and myself, um, who, who um, should, is supposed to be an expert, don't believe him or her right away. Always make sure you stay critical. Because it's so easy these days to like take a headline and find a story and make the story nice, go one level below. I, I share with you why. We tend to think very linear. We tend to think very linear. So if um, I always use the example of 30 steps um, in, in a room and whoever has heard that from, from me on YouTube, just stay calm and wait a minute, but uh, it's important that everyone knows that story. So you take 30 steps in your own length, how far do you make it through the room? 30 steps, everyone for themselves. How far do you get when you take 30 steps through the room? And now, double every step. So take the first step, two steps, then four steps, eight steps, 16, 32, and you do this 30 times. How far are you? How far are you? I usually take voluntolls, so not volunteers. <laughs> so how far? Just give me something. Around the world? Hamburg? Dublin? You're 25 times around the world, four times to the moon and back. Because when you go to the power of 28, 29, 30, you double a very large amount. And even if you ask people who are physicists or mathematics or professors or whoever, like controller, they usually get it wrong because we don't have a feeling for these numbers. And that's what it's all about. We don't have a feeling for the number. So this is how it looks. It grows very slow, then it hits the linear curve and then it goes up all the way. And I give you a first-hand um, experience example later where I experienced that, but it's very simple. This is the magic moment. And just take 2007 when Steve Jobs presented the iPhone and said, there's one more thing, this is the iPhone. That was a magic moment. There were people sitting in the room saying, whoa, back at home guys, stop everything you do, we just built apps for this thing. But there were other people here saying, how can we work with a thing like that as a business phone? It doesn't have a keyboard. Who in the room is the one guy with still a Blackberry? 
<laughs> There's usually one guy in the room. See? In 2008, 2009, when you asked people about the iPhone as a business phone, people were like, how? It doesn't work. And that's why I call that the GG. That's the German graph. <laughs> the typical German reaction, how should that work? It doesn't work. And then you move, sorry, it was too fast, to here to the oh shit area and become the Nokia or the Blackberry of your industry. Just because of, oh, we don't, need, we don't do that. It doesn't work yet. And similar with like VR today, similar with the foldable smartphone from Samsung yesterday, which is impressive, but people then say, oh, what do I need it for? It's not worth it yet, and stuff like that. Similar with new business models, a lot of things where we tend to react emotionally to this area. Number two, knowing versus learning attitude. I recorded a podcast, this is not me playing chess, but recording a podcast with Martin. He's the, the cloud head for Microsoft. And he, he, used to be, he used to work for AWS, so Amazon's web services, by far the largest web services on the planet. And in the podcast, he said one thing, and um, I actually heard it when I heard it a second time. He said, we try currently to become, to move from a knowing organization to a learning organization. And at first I'm like, what is he talking about? This is like bullshit bingo um, business talk or marketing talk. But if you listen to that, he said that in a way that made me think a lot. And I like, what does learning actually mean? What does learning mean? Who has kids? Who has kids? I have two kids. My daughter is turning four on Saturday and my son is like one and a half. And when he started to walk, I always imagine it this way, that the neurons in his brain are like train stations without a train connection in the beginning. So then he stands up for the first time, he starts wobbling, he falls down, his bigger sister comes, kicks him off, and then he thinks, oh, I need a new strategy. So with this he learns, and then he builds a train track in his brain. So that's how I imagine it. I know if there was a newer scientist in the room, he would say it's wrong, but this is how it works in very simple words. And AI, so an artificial intelligence, does it exactly the same way. The interesting thing is now that if I see my son and he falls down, what do I do as a father? I help him up and say, great. I don't stand next to him and say, like, this is not walking. <laughs> <laughs> so we have this knowing attitude with other things. If I tell you guys, hey, why don't we build a new train track between Cologne and Hamburg, which is like four times faster? The usual answer would be, hey, we have an airport, why do we need that for? And there's a train station, like, we don't need that. That's the knowing attitude. And we tend to put that knowing attitude in everything we try to judge about every day. The learning attitude is the kid's attitude, the, the child's mind. Standing up, building something new, trying it out. And AI does exactly the same thing. The difference between a kid and an AI is that we think, oh, why is it doing something which I didn't predict. But by definition, deep learning and AI is doing exactly that thing. But when we read the headlines, it's like Terminator is taking over the world. That's again then the German, the German graph. So if you want to know what this knowing attitude can do with a company, I, I had a company before Blackboard where I'm still shareholder till today, but not managing director. We're like 150 people. Back then, we were growing really fast. We were buying and selling mobile phones. We were the biggest reseller for iPhones and iPads in Germany today. Back then, we were buying Nokia phones, a lot of Nokia phones. Who had a Nokia phone? Who was in the snake game? Okay. So, we were buying and selling these phones. And all of a sudden, in the year 2011, within half a year, this switched to smartphones. And you would say, hey, that's great because the business is buying and selling, smartphones are more valuable, so you guys grew in revenue. Yes, but the problem is, if you buy Nokia phones, 10,000 a month, for 30 bucks each, and then it switches to 10,000 smartphones, which is 130 bucks each, there is a missing million in between that you need to buy these phones. So we almost went bankrupt in that phase when Nokia was wiped off the market as a mobile phone company, they're still there today. And 
I want to share something because we, we learned a lot from that story and if you like, I share a lot about collaboration, which went wrong and so on at Nokia later in the Q&A, but the most important thing was the attitude these guys were working with. This is the Forbes magazine in, in the month, like two months after the iPhone came out. This is a quote from that article where it says, impressive with the 270,000 sold iPhones, but it will not make a dent in our customer base of almost a billion customers. That's attitude. That's attitude. If it will happen or not, doesn't matter. The attitude matters. The positive example is this guy, Jeff Bezos. Again, in Germany, very criticized. Oh, critical, richest man, and now he has this very bad divorce and all that stuff. Forget all that bullshit. In like 10 years, nobody will talk about that anymore. Who cares? This guy is a long-term thinker. And I'm not putting anyone on a podest and say, oh, this is a great guy. The only thing I share is he's a long-term thinker. And this is an interview I found, must be from like 99 or something, so like dot-com phase. And during that area, he was sued by all the big companies. Listen closely to what he's saying. It's getting really nasty out there, it seems to me. The online bookstore, the Barnes & Noble bookstore, is so big it makes Amazon.com look tiny. Seems to me that this is almost a declaration of war. Well, it's not just Barnes & Noble. But one of the Walmart things... is suing you? That's right. And You're surrounded by enemies. People want to get you. Establishment is big and powerful. Do you ever get scared? Well, I, I tell people around here to wake up petrified and afraid every morning. Do you? I do. It is not uncommon for people who have achieved the kind of startling success you have in such a short period of time develop a pretty strong fear about losing it all. Are you afraid of that? I know we can lose it all. It's not a fear. <laughs> it's a fact. <laughs> so, and you think like, wow, what is he talking about? Like, I know we can lose it all. It's not a fear, it's a fact. And what is the slight difference between fear and fact? With fear in the neck, you cannot work. With fear in the neck, you cannot innovate. But if you accept the fact that everything can be different tomorrow, everything, and I don't want to talk about personal fortune, unfortune, like all these things that can happen. But if you accept that, you take the challenge and you stay committed that this can happen. And that's a completely different attitude than being afraid and not being able to think. Because if you're afraid, you cannot think. You just react. And this attitude is still an attitude that Amazon has today. That's why they're in every business aspect, they're always challenging. They're always playing the game like a sports game. And that's very impressive. There is a very good interview on YouTube with uh, Matthias Stöpfner from, from Springer, with him. And he's then talking about like what he's currently doing and how he's thinking. And he's like thinking in 200, 300 year steps. This really takes you out of the, the zone, out of the comfort zone and takes away this next year, five years, 10 years period. So what can you do <laughs> if you say like attitude in everyday life? I give you one example and I know it's quite challenging with you guys because um, I'm pretty sure everyone here uses Outlook every day. Who's using Outlook? Who's using folders for his emails? So here's an attitude thing. There's a very epic invention in the year 2019. It's called search. <laughs> and even with Outlook, even with Outlook, the search works quite well. If not, then you make it work quite well. But we learned to use folders because our mothers told us then we are better organized persons and we put everything into folders away on Friday and make it work and make it sort and so on. That's an attitude thing. And some of you will now feel like, mm, I don't want to take away my folders. It feels difficult. I don't want to do that. But I can tell you, we do some trainings with people when we migrate tools and I do the trainings for the C-level usually. And they have physical fear taking away the folders because they, they, they think they lose something. It's just waste of time. It's a waste of time if you take the facts. But people still do that. That's attitude in everyday life. So try it for a couple of days, put away your folders, forget it and use the search for three days and see how good that works. And you have to go through that phase of, oh, the search doesn't work and I need to change my strategy because this is taking you out of this comfort zone that you're used to. Just one example, homework. Number three, 
and actually to me the most important one. So there is this quote from the 70s, it's called, we shape our tools and thereafter our tools shape us, not the other way around. We shape our tools and thereafter our tools shape us. What does that mean? Let's take an example. A tool can be everything, smartphone, computer, program, whatever. Calendar can also be a tool. Who's using the calendar every day and who has the feeling he's the master of his calendar with enough time every day to do your own stuff? Not too many meetings. Who uses a calendar every day? And who's this master of his calendar with not well, one, two, okay. Good, then let's talk about this example. <laughs> it may be, might be helpful. I met a guy also through the podcast when we did a hike and he was at the White House during this day. The guy you will see in a second is in the background over there, Warren Rustand, 29 years old. And he was in the room when Richard Nixon entered the room and said to Gerald Ford, Mr. Ford, Mr. Vice President, prepare to become president. Warren was the third person in the room. I met him when we did a hike at Lake um, Tegernsee and he looks like that. Um, he's not my grandpa, we just had the same haircut. <laughs> And we then started talking and talking and I'm like, hey Warren, this story is so amazing. We need to share that in a podcast. And he's always very enthusiastic. He's 75 years old. And he's like, yes, of course, but uh, what is a podcast? <laughs> I'm like, okay, <laughs> good. I will show you. So we had a tea and we recorded a podcast. It's not the best quality in, in, in audio, but it's one of the best podcasts for me personally because his attitude changed everything that I was thinking about completely. He's a multi-billionaire by, by today. He has 19 grandchildren. He's a very generous person. So the typical American career you can imagine. He was also NBA uh, basketball player. Anyhow, he is known for inventing the new presidential organization calendar system from Gerald Ford up until Obama. We all know that Donald Trump doesn't use the system. I was asking him, but he didn't want to share any details. So. I asked him, like, what did you do? Because the president, when he is there the first day, like Jared Ford on the first day, receives, received 300 invitations for being on an event physical, giving a speech, attending somewhere. And what you have to know is the American presidential system is reactive, or in the history was reactive. So if you had a topic, you could walk up to the White House, up until Lincoln, enter the White House and say, I have something and I need to talk to the president. And if it was important enough, you went through to the president. So he received so many invitations. And I can tell you, most of the boards in Germany, you like wipe them off with like 10 invitations per day. And then they're completely loaded with like checking, oh, do we need to attend there? Is the chancellor there? And so on. So 300 every day. So what he changed, very simple, it was super simple. He actually reserved one day at, um, at the, 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 the presidential retreat at Camp David in the beginning and they were defining what is the legacy, what do I want to like hand over to the next president and then, very important word, what is my priority? By definition, singular. And we bullshit ourselves by making priorities, the plural word. word. And then he asked me in the podcast, so, and I never cut anything out of the podcast, he asked me, so what's your priority? Think about it. What's your priority? Just think about it for a moment. So my answer, like many people, when you think about it, oh, of course, family. And you're like, hmm, that's interesting. You just told me um, your wife had your second son, just gave birth three weeks ago. It's Sunday and you're here with me, but not at home in Hamburg with your family. <laughs> I'm like, oh shit. <laughs> <laughs> this is no life in the podcast. So. He really challenged the way I was thinking about priorities. I was bullshitting myself up until that day thinking of I can manage priorities. And he said, and we, we make that work in that system. And then if we have that, we have such a fundament that we define in the presidential calendar zero to two weeks, just 15 minute slots, two to six weeks, one hour slots, six weeks ahead, daily slots for like rolling meetings ahead. This is how they keep the overview. This changes everything. If you have your priorities clear, you can say yes or no right away. Forget all this email bullshit because you just delete emails that are not part of the priority. I just say it black and white, we can talk about that later. Very simple. So if we think about tools today, 
the calendar is not the most powerful tool, but definitely this thing here. Every one of you guys has a smartphone with you. And that's why I usually ask the question, if we think about we shape our tools and thereafter our tools shape us. Who of you uses notifications? So the phone vibrates in the pocket when you're at the talk. You can see little ones, threes, fours for the males. You have little notifications here. Who of you has these notifications turned on? Who of you has no notifications, nothing? No number, no app notification, no vibration, nothing. How often do you look on your phone every day? So if you're a millennial like me, we are on average 130 times. We are beyond 100, on average 130 times. If you're Generation Z like my camera guy Marcel back there, how often? Today, you can check. So think about that for a moment. You have this device and you then are, you, you are led by this device. It tells you, look at me now. By more than 130 times per day, why do you need notifications? How often? Today, 107. 107. Okay, you were editing today. We had examples when Gen Z does more than 220 per day. Why do you need notifications? Why? You're used by the phone. And we always complain about these things as a distraction, but we don't understand the word of we shape our tools. We shape, that's the part that we miss. And that's the part that we usually see missing in most of the organizations we work with. One of the tools you guys work with is, is the email. It's a typical tool. We are shaped by the email. What did we do with the email? We actually transferred facts to the email. Who remembers back in the days when you were at school how you were informed when a teacher was sick? <laughs> Telephone kette. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Phone chain. You call the first one, you call the next one and so on. With the email you can inform everyone with one click. Imagine if we are one project group and you want to like stay informed in the project group. With an email, we could have a project email address and then keep everyone in the loop all the time with short messages. But what did we do? We took the email. We started to using it as a fax, using a subject, saying, hey, how was your weekend? Here are the tasks. Then we structure a whole document that we should actually should write in a Word document or somewhere else. Then we have a signature, which is bullshit because everyone in the company know, knows who we are. Then we have this please do not print for the environment bullshit. And then we have this do not forward this email when it's something gone wrong way bullshit, which is nonsense because an email by definition is a transparent communication tool. This is how we are used by this tool. We didn't shape this tool. So back to the smartphone, very simple. We talked about it. T turning off the notifications is one thing of making this thing a tool, but I want to give you one one task for the next week and you can give it a try and I know it's very hard for you guys internally at the moment. So when you start at Blackboard, you can say, I need this and this device to make my work work. When Marcel started, he said, if I w need to edit on the road, which we did for the last two days to publish your guys' YouTube video, which we will publish tonight, then I need this 15 inch 4K Dell laptop. And I'm like, this is three and a half thousand. Are you nuts? Then I want the new MacBook Pro 15 inch and he's like, wow, that's a like six and a half thousand laptop. What do you need that for? I'm like, I'm the managing director. <laughs> and then he said, yeah, but like your task is leading, not editing. And you tell everyone you use your phone all the time. So we came up with the idea. Why don't we film and see how it looks like me using for one week smartphone only. So I went on a week to just using the smartphone and then actually recognized these things became way more powerful than I thought. So starting to type is very stupid on a smartphone, so I use speech to text, so I talk. And after like three days, this thing understands what I'm saying, so I never type on the smartphone anymore. And I'm much faster in talking than actually in writing on the computer. So after a week, I went back on the computer to write emails, and I'm like, whoa, this feels like very old stuff. Of course, you need to think through what you're saying before you talk, but this is usually very helpful. There are other things. 
you actually see the world how 99% of the consumers see the world with an app. You actually experience this change because you think this, is, this doesn't work. I cannot send out an estimation. I cannot send out a presentation. But going through that phase helps you to rewire your neurons that are not connected and say, okay, I find a new way. We publish complete YouTube videos. We publish presentations. We send invoices from here. I usually don't make emails anymore because emails are bullshit anyways, but I like do all the messaging on here. The only reason why I carry this guy is because we have a keynote presentation and usually the guys from, from the tech team become very nervous when I say, okay, this is my presentation device, which I did for a while, but I didn't want it to make, like, cause a heart attack anymore. And the other reason is a bigger device for editing, like editing really large movie files, which you cannot edit here. But in the worst case, I'm able to make a movie with the best camera in the world, the one you have with you. So that's a very powerful device. And it feels very good, by the way, for my people if you're at the airport and then you have the guy in front who's using his uh, Dell notebook, then the personal MacBook, then the iPad Pro, of course, with the pen, and then the personal phone and then the business phone and you just have your smartphone. And this changes your attitude towards working and looking at the organization. That's just a little challenge. Who would accept the challenge? Smartphone for one week? Smartphone for one week. Challenge accepted? Okay, challenge accepted. Give me feedback on Twitter. Give me feedback. Give it a try in the company. Give it a try even in the company and see where are the limits of doing that. Uh, we actually uh, had a podcast with Matthias Döffner and he shared that he does it that way um, in, at Springer. So um, he then shared that in the podcast and like, you know that this is public if we send that? And he says, yes, I know that. Okay. So he writes every article, all the emails on his smartphone. You need to change the way you work if you want to do that. So these three things, nobody knows anything. The knowing versus the learning attitude. We shape our tools and thereafter our tools shape us. This is, to me, how I learned to like forget my emotional reaction and go back to this response that is going like one level deeper and not just reacting. And if we go back to this example from Lee Sedol, who was beaten by the computer, you could say, he could sit there and say, this is unfair. You cannot use a computer in this game because this game is like 3,000 years old. We have a tradition. What he did was he sat at the press conference and said, this computer, this AI, changed the way I looked at this game and it changed the way I looked at my life. It's the best tool for me to learn how this game works because the machine used a strategy that was not in one single book that were written for over 3,000 years. So all the books of Go had to be rewritten. I mean, this is pure augmentation of human skills by AI. In Germany, we would have a headline in Spiegel, computers need to be forbidden at the game of Go, but that's a different story. So the reaction from South Korea was, okay, we have a fund this year starting, like back then, this year starting over 4 billion for AI, which is now growing. Just to give you a small comparison in Germany, in the year 2019, we have a fund for free Wi-Fi at schools, but just for the hardware, not for the guys who need to do the admin. So this is what it's all about, the attitude behind the change. And I would say, let's uh, open up the Q&A and uh, go you guys from here. This is where we publish the YouTube video tonight from you guys, okay? Thank you for listening.